Welcome to Conversations with Changemakers. I'm Elizabeth Filippouli, the founder of Global Thinkers Forum, an international nonprofit organization that promotes accountability and leadership. Over the years, we have built a diverse network of social impact thought leaders with whom we share a common vision to promote values-based leadership. The forum was incubated at Oxford University's Said Business School in 2011. In this series, we interview change makers from different parts of the world. We want to hear how they are going through this coronavirus crisis as professionals and as individuals. And we invite them to share insights and forecasting for the day after. Today, I'm interviewing Patrick Fleming, the CEO of the Jubilee Sailing Trust. The Jubilee Sailing Trust is a charitable organization that launched in 1978 with the aim to bring together both able-bodied and disabled individuals through tall ship sailing. The JST, as it is known, gets everyone on board involved in sailing, focusing on what people can do instead of what they can't. It is a brilliant organization and I'm truly delighted to speak today to their CEO. Patrick, welcome to Conversations with Changemakers. Thank you and good morning to you. I'm delighted to be here. Tell us more about the Jubilee Sailing Trust. It is such an exciting organization which has transformed the lives and thinking of hundreds of people over the years. How did the journey begin? The journey began um, through the inspiration of two individuals uh, who decided that actually disabled people in particular had been unrealistically restricted from involved, being involved in ocean adventures, um, mainly because of prejudices and reluctance of people to accept that able-bodied people should mix with disabled people. And when the journey started, did it begin with the two tall ships from day one or how did it grow? It started um, with the vision of one tall ship, which was the Lord Nelson. And it was intended to create a ship that actually would be able to maximise the opportunity for uh, the most extreme circumstances of, of a disabled person. And the logic was that actually to explain adventure to people in wheelchairs that adventure had to be met so the objective was to actually enable uh, a wheelchair to be hoisted with great safety to the top of a 40-foot mast so the ship followed that theme really that actually had to be built to accommodate everything that would enable wheelchair access to occur and everything was built around that philosophy do you have in mind any stories which have been life transforming? I mean, I know you joined the organization fairly recently, a few months ago, but I'm sure that you must know of you know, some people who have shared how this journey became an experience that changed the way they, they operated as individuals. I think once it was established that you could actually create opportunity for disabled people. It began the topic of conversation uh, about diversity, isolation, access and inclusion. And so quite quickly on the journey, the trust decided that uh, disabled people in wheelchairs was of course a, a very important part of the thinking. But it was important as well to actually start to understand what happens if you are in a wheelchair and of course that really means that you're isolated in all sorts of different ways and so the debate started with the trustees at the time that actually lots of people were socially isolated and if you think about how far ago that was it was very inspired to think that uh, inclusion could actually be a theme that could be created around a tall ship and ocean adventures so yes there are many many stories i think that uh, it's been great for me to go through the treasure trove of those stories over the last few months and they are many and varied and we've had people with you know, young um, people who are blind, people who have autism, people who have been uh, 
um, victimized, people who are um, autistic, uh, people who are suffering agoraphobia. And so all sorts of needs have been met. And I think the important point to to make in that is that actually we don't just make these decisions on our own, that actually the trust relies upon the voluntary skills of medical personnel, particularly doctors, to actually enable us to make sure that when we engage with people who have been isolated, that the right support is in place to enable them to, have, to actually take part in our voyages. Well, the month of March 2020 must be one of the strangest on record. Due to the COVID-19 crisis, uh, Patrick, most charities have now closed their offices. Staff are working at home. How has um, JST reacted to this ongoing COVID-19 reality? Well, indeed, March <laughs> was a, a turning point in many ways for the whole world wasn't it but for us it was an extraordinary time really because the ship was um, in Antigua and she was heading uh, for Piraeus and the plan was that she would sp spend spring and summer in the Mediterranean and that was going to be a lucrative event time for us so we would be would have been in Piraeus in Cyprus and then we would have gone on to Monaco and we'd planned events in Monaco, uh, obviously a very rich society and who were very keen to support us. Uh, and then we were going to take place in the now cancelled all ships race. So those were the plans. Uh, unfortunately, as we all know, that as, as soon as uh, the pandemic really became such a, an extraordinary event, I was left with no option but to turn the ship back and bring her home. So. The first thing about that was that the journey home from where she was at the time was 35 days. So I had uh, nearly 60 people on board a ship living in a perfect bubble, uh, all healthy, all well, while the rest of the world was in lockdown. And so it was quite an extraordinary period at that point alone. Of course, the consequences of that are quite immense for a charity because obviously we lost at least half a million pounds in revenue by not taking part in all the things we were planning to do uh, and bringing her home immediately meant that the, the crew and the reserve crew had no ship to sail on and so the net result of that is that I've now got 20 crew furloughed and I've got three office staff furloughed too so in many many ways it has been um, a devastating experience for us um, in terms of our financial welfare and sustainability but at another level it has been one of sort of massive complexity in the sense that planning for how you get back into operational mode on a ship with social distancing um, is almost an impossible thing and it, the ship might be very brilliantly clever at all sorts of things for needy people but social distancing is not really something that was ever planned into uh, life on board so it has been a, a very, very challenging time for us. Uh, you're right to make the point about offices. So the office obviously closed immediately. I closed the office and all staff that are remaining are working from home. What you just raised is uh, really a matter of great concern for so many charities because there is the challenge of remaining relevant or even visible in these times of crisis, but also beyond this crisis. How can charities adapt not only their messaging, but also their programs? And what are the plans for JEST for whenever we're able to uh, go back to some form of normality, some form of at least catching up on the time that we've lost? The important thing I, for us was really, I think that it was crucial that we messaged our community and the people who were watching us very carefully. Uh, obviously as a historic charity, we're watched all the time by thousands of people who are engaged with us. And the first fear would be that that could kill us, you know, basically that um, the opportunity to sail um, would be taken away forever. So that was a real risk. So what I thought was crucially important was to release as soon as possible our voyage plans for 2021 and to make a statement that actually we will continue, we will fight on. 
simply because our donor network needed to know that that's what our intention was and actually that we thought we would be able and we are able to fight through this problem. I mean, fortunately, we've got great support. And so uh, whilst it's a, it's a tough time, for sure it is, and our income has been completely devastated in terms of what we would expect to see, but the messaging went out, we, we will have a very uh, expansive tour. We will uh, return to the UK after being in the Caribbean and the Canaries in the winter. And we'll be back in the UK for the spring and summer. And then we'll join the um, reprogrammed tall ships race. So if, effectively, what that immediately gave us was an extraordinary response in bookings for voyages next year. So in, in some ways, we, our statement of intent has worked for us. Your point is well made about how do you prepare for it? Well, uh, I spend quite a lot of time at the moment talking to our medical advisors to try and resolve how, A, you get crew back on board a ship and all the social distancing things that we just talked about. But it's more than that. It's actually about how do you move away from staff who are if you like, at home locked in. Uh, some of them are actually shielding relatives. So if effectively some of the human decisions to make are how do you separate that away from working people? And I, I guess my approach with that is you don't. This, they're a body of people and they all need to be treated the same way. And people who are shielding should be respected and honoured and looked after. They shouldn't be punished in some ways in terms of salaries. So there are big issues for us in that, in terms of is that a sufficient resource? And the way that the medical view is, is that effectively people would have to be uh, in a bubble of isolation, uh, either individually or in a hotel for two weeks, and then another 48 hours on top of that. So for us, the simple challenges of actually reconnecting a crew with a tall ship is massively problematic. And that's notwithstanding anything that could happen in the meantime. And of course, the risk is, is that because the testing regime is so fragile and flaky, that I and the medics can't feel comfortable that actually we could guarantee a date by which the crew would return to the ship. So there are many, many challenges. Patrick, you have served as Director of International Development for the British Library for many years and after a long and successful career in media. Everything has changed within three months. We're currently in the month of June. This world is a different place and the economic impact as a, as a result of the lockdown measures will be massive. How do you see the role of philanthropy? in this new ecosystem. You have worked with philanthropists and foundations in the past, so you know that um, landscape pretty well. Do you see a different landscape or do you see philanthropists acquiring an even more, if you like, prominent role in supporting uh, charities, good causes and social impact? Without a doubt, I think the world of international philanthropy um, will change. I think that the responses to the pandemic have been um, extraordinary to watch from um, a, a lens of called philanthropy. I think some of the people that are known givers, trusts, foundations, billionaires, um, the giving list population, they've all responded as one would expect to um, treat the pandemic as being an extraordinary um, occurrence that um, has an impact and so there's no doubt at all that money has been flowing into the right areas I think mainly if you think about the UK and nations worldwide anything to do with um, medical support for health services the NHS in the UK particularly has been the priority for philanthropists and I think there's no doubt at all that actually small charities like mine I guess we I thought very carefully about the timing of actually sending out a new voyage list. Um, what I didn't want to be seen to be doing was in any way competing in our very small way, but nonetheless perceived to be competing with philanthropists who were investing, including us, uh, in the NHS. So I think that alone has been a, an interesting phenomena. But I think that what it's meant for us is that um, some of the predictable gifting that we would now experience into our new financial year which sort of starts in April hasn't happened 
uh, not in, in terms of the level of giving has not been as strong as we would expect it to have been without a pandemic. And I think a lot of that talking to donors is about not reluctance to support us. It's actually about fear of the consequences of the pandemic, not only in terms of their capacity to give, but also the not sure about where the world is anymore. And I think that whilst that has uh, a, a sort of a natural human instinct to it. It is very, very frightening because it's um, it's destabilised even the most confident of givers. Do you see or have you thought of new revenue streams or fundraising methods um, to be able to support uh, the charity going forward? Because I don't think that we have heard anything from the government when it comes to supporting charity organizations. I mean, the businesses have been supported and they should be supported because uh, we do not have the luxury, we cannot afford, you know, uh, in rising unemployment to go even higher, which it will anyway, it's inevitable. But what about charities and the charity sector in the UK? Well, I think we do have to change without a doubt. And we do have to innovate and we've been thinking very carefully myself and my trustees about what does that mean and i guess that that the first thing to to look at from a charity like ours is sustainability and, and to question whether what we're doing is still the right thing to do are we committed to our mission do we believe in our mission are we promoting our mission properly um, so we've ticked all those boxes, you know, with yeses, of course we are. But the reality of it is, is that it costs my charity two and a half million pounds a year to, to run. That's what it costs. 30% of the bookings fees come to contribute to the bottom line, but the rest has to come from fundraising. Fortunately, you know, we do have loyal donors, but we don't have loyal donors that automatically give me you know, two and a half million pounds a year. So... What I'm desperately trying to do is to think about where innovation sits. And for some years, I suppose I was dealing with this question in my last life for the British Library, where all organisations in the public sector, charities and so forth, face the same dilemma in a post-COVID world. Is, is, you know, as uh, Rishi Sunak said, you know, the government won't be able to support all charities and they won't be able to support all businesses. I think... We were very fortunate at the library in the sense we, we, we do know uh, Rishi and we do know his, his lovely wife Akshata because they're friends of the British Library. And when Rishi did actually outline uh, support for small businesses, he was very, very quick to point out the word charities as being part of that. I think that that somehow got lost in the telling for me. I think that after he said it, it didn't seem to be... Um, very very quickly followed up by government and so we have been fighting quite hard as a charity to get the message across that we do need support and I think it's important that we do that however I think that charities that are going to survive have to stand on their own two feet and it's ever been thus so I guess the innovation that I would be looking for would be to turn our charitable cause into a little, little bit more than simply just asking for money I think we need to spread our thinking to things like gifts in kind. And I think that I require not only paid staff, but I require volunteers. I want companies to think about skill sets that they may be able to provide through voluntary schemes from staff. I think very much that reserves in charities have to become uh, pipelines for sustainability so I think that charities are going to have to start to think about how philanthropists not only gift but also benefit not only in terms of brand perception and so forth but let's just say that they a philanthropist gives a million pounds to a charity I do wonder whether uh, half of that let's say could be ring fenced with earning potential or investment potential or um, at one level uh, to enable long-term sustainability of a charitable base with the other half a million if you like to be able to be drawn down on regular intervals and I just think we just need to be a little bit more clever about reward and recognition for philanthropists who actually support a charity.
So that's sort of one level, I guess, of the thinking. Um, the other level of the thinking is to sort of understand trends. And I, I do think that one of the great things about the fallout from the pandemic has been, particularly with the government's UK government strategy and followed around the world with furloughing, is that what it enabled organisations to do, and we've been benefiting too, is to enable um, people who are furloughed to volunteer. So I think volunteering has always been part of the mantra of my charity. Uh, and I've got around sort of 900 volunteers around the UK who regularly support us by running events for us, by telling the stories for us, by actually writing blogs for us, by doing all sorts of things. But I think that if we take that as its best principle, I think there's a, there's a lot to be campaigned for with organisations, particularly organisations, PLCs particularly, again, that have CSR commitments. Uh, do you think that as a lesson from this global catastrophe, uh, we should reprioritize our values as individuals, as citizens of a planet that is much more fragile than we would like to think? And of course, as companies, you talked about uh, CSR and corporate social responsibility, which has been a trend over the past few years, but uh, it is now uh, imperative that more companies adopt their CSR strategies to meet the needs that the COVID-19 crisis has generated. Well, a lot's going to change, isn't it? And I think one of the fallouts is going to be that uh, offices or office, the domain of the office um, where people are going to work, are commuting to work, are traveling long distances, that's going to change. And I guess we're, we would all intellectually observe that the universe is a much more um, happy place in terms of environment than it has been for many, many years. I mean, the sky feels bluer. We're all seeing much more about the world around us than we ever did before and I think all that does affect people's sort of value chains. I think the other thing that has been I think it's been growing around the world is, is the rebirth of community. I think that actually we're much more receptive now to particularly uh, outside major cities but also within major cities to have some sort of sense for uh, who our neighbours are, what their needs are and there are wonderful stories that you hear every day about you know, people being prepared to talk to a neighbour they've not talked to before, not because they don't want to, just because they're shy. And I think that collective value shifting will take place. And I just hope that that becomes um, a new piece of framework thinking for, for people around the world. And perhaps a new uh, moral compass for all of us, because that threat has exposed everyone's fragility and everyone's, you know, very um, easy and direct exposure to risk. Patrick, thank you very much for your time today. Would you like to share with our audience the website which they can visit and perhaps uh, donate to uh, the Jubilee Sailing Trust? Yes, that's very kind. It's uh, www.jst.org.uk. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure talking to you and thank you for listening to the Global Thinkers Forum podcast, Conversations with Changemakers. Follow us on social media. On Twitter, we are at Global Thinkers F and you can email us on info at globalthinkersforum.org. We invite you to explore our work and join our incredible network of people who want to actively do something positive for our world, a world in crisis. Keep safe and well.